Hello, Interwebs. I hope you're all doing well. And I am extremely excited today because I am joined by two people who um, I am deeply honored that I get to talk with today. Uh, first and foremost, I have the wonderful Kirsten Beyer, who is all big and famous now as the uh, executive producer, one of the creators of Star Trek Picard, uh, but who I have a great affection for from her time writing Star Trek Voyager novels, um, which I deeply love and own all of. Uh, so I that's just a big part of my heart. And then someone who I also hold just as much affection for, uh, Mike Johnson, who wrote the wonderful Kelvin timeline comics and many, many others, um, but are also like, in my opinion, and this is someone who loves the Kelvin timeline movies, they're the best parts of the Kelvin timeline uh, world. I think you, your comics are fantastic. And again, that's someone who's like, I love all of the, the Kelvin timeline films, even uh -huh. Into Darkness, I will fight for, so. Thank you so much, and it's an honor to be here. Love your videos. Thank awesome. you for being such a great ambassador for Star Trek. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolute, yeah, it's just an absolute pleasure to finally meet you. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you both. I honestly that that I was saying this before we were doing the we were recording, but that really truly does mean a lot to me. Like from both of you, especially like that's just like makes like makes me. I'm gonna be probably geeking out for like days after this. Let's do it. Let's do so. it. Let's do it together. Yeah. Um, but. So before I do that, um, let's actually talk about what we're here for, because today we're here to talk about the recently released uh, Star Trek Picard audio drama, No Man's Land, which both of you work together on um, to release, which I have to say, as a huge audio drama fan, I was like freaking out when I heard that news. I've been wanting audio dramas for, to come back to Star Trek for forever. So I guess my first question to both of you is like, what made you want to do audio dramas? What made you want to do this project? Well, it was Simon and Schuster's idea. Um, they approached me about three years ago and asked if um, we could get started thinking about a Picard, uh, specifically audio drama, to launch sort of like a new era in this for them. And um, I thought it was a fantastic idea as well. Uh, but at the time, we were sort of just finishing up season one and hadn't really started on season two. And since we, all these things usually tend to be bridge stories of some mm -hmm. kind, it kind of took some time to get to season two and then figure out, you know, the best way to, to, to the best story to tell really. Within that little like gap that's in there. Yeah. And so how did Mike, how did you sort of get roped into, into doing the audio drama? Did they approach at the same time or? Uh, no, I'm, uh, Kirsten was very kind to invite me on actually. I think we might've been in the middle of one of our discovery comics and, um, yeah, I'm always up for a new, different kind of writing challenge, and and um, this was yeah irresistible. So I'm, uh, I'd say if you want to break into audiobooks, really know Kirsten Beyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say, so, it's yeah, all about who you know. It's all about it, who you it, know. It, ultimately, <laughs> it is actually. So yeah, I was very fortunate to to jump on. Well, I also I work with a lot of different creative folks, and Mike is is one of my most favorite collaborators and creative partners. Um, we have a wonderful time working together. So that was an easy choice. Well, it's 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 basically like um, you know, how you've sort of situated yourself, right? Where you've been the person who kind of had one foot in the sort of like tie-in stuff when you came on to uh, originally Discovery and then in Picard, and then sort of became that like liaison between those two elements, which as a fan, I've been super appreciative of like being like, oh, this not I know it's always like canon until proven or sorry, not canon until proven to be canon. Um, but I, I do really enjoy like the more interconnected nature and like the very clear like communication between all of the projects. Um, so I mean, get, getting into that, like, I know you said that it was sort of took a while to figure out what exactly this was going to be. But what was that process like of like figuring out like what No Man's Land actually was going to be and how did you settle upon it being about Rafi and Seven of Nine? Well, I think two of the um, bigger sort of dangling threads left from the beginning of season one were definitely uh, what's going on with Rafi and Seven. Um, and also uh, Seven was a character who joined us in the middle of season one uh, and who has a huge history with Trek, but we learned you know, very little about the previous 20 years of her life. We found her in a very changed place and uh, so there was a tremendous appetite as much as we could to start to unpack some of that. And it felt like um, reuniting her with the Fenris Rangers for a short period of time might be a, a fun way to do that. Um, and there were, you know, um, 
basically everyone working in tie-ins was like, can you do a Finnish Ranger story? I'd like to do a Finnish Ranger story. <laughs> yeah. Seven and the Rangers. Yeah. yeah. You and them and everyone in the fandom, I remember Twitter was like, like hot <laughs> for a while. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and initially I was just sort of holding back because I wasn't sure where the best place to start telling that story might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it became clear we were going to do this audio drama, I thought this is really where we needed to go with it. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the things that I, I loved about season one of Picard was there was all these like little hints at the greater world that we didn't get to explore, but it felt like there was a fully fleshed out sort of things that happened in the universe as opposed to it just being like, we're just going to narrow on the focus. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of the things for, for both of you, um, well, actually, before I go there, I, I, I will say, um, how did you get uh, sort of rope in um, both Michelle Hurd and um, Jerry Ryan? into doing the, into doing this project? I mean, did you approach them or did uh, Simon and Schuster, like what was the, how did that conversation go? That was a Simon and Schuster conversation. We came up with a story, we had an outline everybody loved. And then Simon and Schuster took their time to talk to Jerry and Michelle and make sure that they were interested in doing it and could get on board. And once they had agreed to do it, that's when we went ahead and wrote the actual script. Okay, so it came first and then you, they approached them. I, I'm sort of curious. I mean, this is probably a question for them if I ever get the chance to ask them about it. But like, how did you feel like asking these actors or working with these actors to create this side story, knowing that they were also going to sort of like maybe possibly use this to inform their characters going to season two? And actually kind mm-hmm. of with that, did this, did this, um, come did they perform this before or during or after season two was being told and i'm curious like what the the timeline of that was it was actually after season two that they performed Mm -hmm. it so i was able to sit there while we were working on season two and use everything that was happening to inform the story that we were doing um and it did feel like kind of a shame that they didn't really realize this story even existed until after the fact but the nice thing was once they sat down and dug into it they were able to see it as sort of like a wonderful transition. Like it does sort of flow seamlessly between season one and season two. And they felt that emotionally as well, playing it, which is I think one of the things that that made it so strong. Mm. And kind of uh, for for both of you, but I want to sort of toss this one to Mike too. Like this, because of that, because you actually have the actors playing this role, uh, and actually like being informed in this, obviously, again, this is still, you know, it's a tie in thing. It could be rewritten at any point. And, you know, I just say Q rewrote it or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, there has to be an element of feeling like it's a little bit more like concrete. And I know Kirsten, you're like, you work on the actual show. So you're like, I get to make canon every day. Um, but, but Mike, like, how does it feel to go yeah. from like having this chance to like, instead of it just being like, I'm siloed into a comic where it's kind of my own thing, maybe working with the artist, that sort of thing. Or being like, oh, now I'm actually making something that the actors are actually going to perform. Yeah, it was great. It was really cool. Kirsten and I have talked about when Kirsten came over to do comics, I was sort of showing her the comics ropes, but I'd never written dialogue for, I'd I'd written a couple episodes on Transformers Prime years ago, Mm -hmm. but I hadn't, other than that, hadn't written dialogue for actors to perform. So that was both thrilling and terrifying, but Kirsten was there to show me the ropes of that because obviously in comics, you're writing for the reading experience. You're definitely trying to capture the the characters' voices. Like that's the same, Mm -hmm. I think, across all media. But now we actually have the characters' voices. Yeah. Um, And uh, so it was was a great learning process. And um, I actually added, you know, sort of like, nervous like is, are they gonna think that they sound like the characters Kirsten is there and and knows them and they trust her as well um but it's also like yeah the fact that they know their characters so well mm-hmm. is is only a plus I mean so I mean that has to be like part of the fun I mean it has to be part of the fun too with writing television too I would presume where it's like you're you're getting to be in collaboration as opposed to it being like this is just me I get to be inside the heads in like a novel or a comic I get to make all the decisions uh, for the most part. Uh, but now you're like, oh, like the way I wrote it, you know, Jerry Ryan may have a different spin on it that may be just as valid or things like that. Was there any like moments for either of you that were like, oh, I, I didn't like, I didn't see this interpretation, but Michelle, Jerry, or any of the other actors in the audio drama may have taken it a different way. I think they just brought so much nuance hmm. that, you, I mean, the simple word is emotion, but nuance to lines that maybe we didn't really think about as being maybe hitting a particular emotional beat that maybe it was just sort of moving a scene along 
and we had other lines that we thought might really hit home, but there might be, a, I can't think off the top of my head, but I just remember listening to it and thinking, wow, that, that delivery carries so much weight and is adding subtext and emotion that, um, you know, I wasn't expecting. So that was, that was a treat to, to hear. Yeah. I have to, I have to agree. Like having listened to it, I was like really shocked by, I mean, not, I mean, they're both wonderful actors, um, but it's just, it was just shocked by like how moving a lot of it was. And mm -hmm. especially the, the quieter moments, you know, with, with, you know, Picard is a kind of more slower paced show than Discovery. Um, and so you do get those like quieter moments a little bit more than you get, uh, get in Discovery, which is much more active adventure again, someone who loves Discovery. Um, but what I found even more refreshing with this audio drama is we get even more time, like the first, what, 10 minutes of this drama is like them just on a date, which was really uh, like wonderful. Like I, I just enjoyed that. And I'm and like my little shipper heart just like <laughs> swooned at that. And so like, was that something that you, you consciously thought about that we wanted to like take our time with this audio drama? Well, yeah, I mean, when you, the target length was always, you know, an hour and a half to two hours. And that's a really long story when it comes to situations that tend to be resolved within, you know, 43 minutes, 44 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we thought of it kind of from the beginning as a feature and were excited to be able to really take our time where we wanted to, to let things sort of happen. I think that's also one of the benefits of the form because mm -hmm. in a weird way, I think the ear gets bored more slowly than maybe the eyes do. I think we're so accustomed to images shifting and moving very quickly and following things along, but it doesn't happen when you're just listening to something. Um, one of the, the, the chunks of this that really surprised me the most in the performance of it ended up being the letters. Mm. And um, that is a thing you could never do on television. You're not gonna sit still for an actor to read three very long you know, sections of prose like that um, and yet in this format, it didn't feel at all like I was, you know, that I was, uh, that it was too much information or just, you know, it, 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 it was surprising and very emotional, actually very touching for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I particularly found there's so many moments throughout this that I, I was particularly like hit by. I think one of mine, and we're getting into like the actual meat of the story, um, was, the moment where Raffi takes away Seven's agency uh, and like transports her away. And then just really, uh, I thought was probably my favorite moment was when Seven like calls Raffi out and that's like, I was a Borg for forever and my agency was taken away from me. Don't take it away from me now. And how much that resonated. Um, and so like, how did you find moments, both of you like find moments like that to like really call up, like what makes Seven unique as a character uh, and really drill into those like, beats with it within this audio drama well the whole time we were thinking of both characters with everything that we knew about them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what were the sort of threads you wanted to pull on and and a lot of it you know you're asking the question what's getting in the way of this relationship just happening right because clearly there's an attraction there and these are two grown women who clearly know what they like and what they want so so what is the problem um, but when you start thinking about where they've both come from, and especially um, the trauma of Seven's life from, you know, the time she was six till the time she was 18 or 22 or whatever it was, um, that is going to back up on you. And that is something that is going to make it very difficult to um, connect, even if you want to. So uh, I think in both cases, there was just a lot of stuff that was already there, that it was a matter of just kind of picking up and turning around and trying to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that it's a love story that's not a love story in the sense that we're used to watching in, a, in the time frame of, of a movie. It doesn't hit the beats of like two people who are sort of flirting and then start to fall in love. And it's more an exploration of what it takes when two people are do meet and are wondering, because it doesn't always happen at the right time in your life. Um, but that you might you might think that person's my future, but you're mm -hmm. not sure yet. Um, so it's 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 just it's ended up being such a much more interesting love story because the ending isn't foretold. We're not going to leave the theater. We're not going to know. We're going to leave the theater an hour and a half, and these people are going to be 
you know, together at the end, right? Yeah. That makes for such a more interesting story. And something that I think could, could only happen in this type of project, which is meeting these characters between two seasons of a television show and sort of carving out this space to tell this story. Yeah, I was actually, I was just going to say that, like, that's what I really love about tie-in fiction, like, the, the best tie-in fiction for me, unless it's, like, going off and doing its own thing, like, you know, the, like, its own storyline, like the New Frontier novels or the Vanguard novels or things like that, yeah. um, is that when it's sort of taking place in a particular spot in canon, that you take, like, okay, here's point A, here's point C, where's the point B in the middle, and mm -hmm. and I think that that really just is, is cool in this audio drama, because it, it is not just, like, oh, the end of the story is like them kissing and getting off to go run off to be together. But it's just them like just figuring out the like the initial stages, like, are we a thing? Like, what is this? It's just, it's just that, um, which I think is just a really cool uh, place to set it. And sort of jumping off of that question, I think like, how did you sort of figure that out their relationship here? I, I like, I, I one of the things, uh, let me ask this in two, two different questions actually. Um, I'll just stick with that one. Like, how did you sort of figure out like how these two characters would sort of collide with each other, figuring out their relationship with each other and like where you think their struggles were going to be? I think that both of us had the instinct that you're going to find a lot of it in adventure. Mm -hmm. that the thing that sort of binds these two people together is they both have a deep need and a deep desire to help people and to, mm -hmm. to feel of use and to do good. Um, so that if we could... Uh, find a journey for them that included that kind of action adventure, that's how you were going to knock them together. Because they were automatically going to have different points of view and different ideas about the best way to do a thing. And in any show where either one of them was by themselves, you would follow that idea. You put two really good ideas together, but they disagree, and you've got instant um, conflict and are raising the stakes on the relationship, right? It's like, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how we feel about each other, if we can't work together, what's that like, you know? Um, and then I think also just, they both have, um, they both have sort of traps that they fall into, things that they fall back on. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw a lot of that, I think, in the series. Uh, yeah. And we were able to take some of those moments and um, expand upon them a little bit here. You know, the sevens, Good you know, trauma. she is to run, mm -hmm. you know, when things get tough. Uh, and not because she's not strong, but just because why not? Why stay and fight it? What's what's worth that? No, and it's interesting because that's um you know I'm I'm doing a Voyager rewatch at the moment too, so I've just watched episodes like um Dark Frontier or uh, the the season finale of season four, I forget the name of it, but like Seven just constantly like I don't want to go I don't want to go back to the Alpha Quadrant. That's too scary for me. And so that like the constant theme of like kind of running away from stuff and that through line of her character, I think is 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 really cool to see both in Picard. And how that connects and then within this as well of just like running away from stuff um and so this gets me to kind of like uh this is probably my most biting question <laughs> but it's one that i think like it, i think it's a good conversation to have i know um especially in in disco season one and picard season one um there was there was a certain like element of frustration from the lgbtq community looking at looking at the shows um being like oh these the the shows are being very representative of you know the lgbtq community but then there was also issues of like when, where does it get to become explicit and i know like for this relationship specifically of seven and raffi they kind of the actors kind of found that within the performance and i know um michael uh, shaban sort of said that that was sort of something they discovered together um and so but i also know that i i you know my feeling is that I know there was some criticism of like, oh, it just gets relegated to this small little moment on screen where they kind of hold hands towards the end of season one and how that felt a little bit frustrating, especially in this era of like wanting to see it more explicitly. So I'm curious, like how you've sort of thought, um, both of you sort of thought of like how to navigate that within this. I mean, obviously, like I'm assuming this goes into Picard season two. It's not just going to be like ignored. But I, 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 I always wonder, you know, hearing these criticisms as a creator of, of like a show and working on tie-in fictions, how you sort of like address it and do it like having to be like, wait a little bit and we promise we'll get to it. But also like wanting to, uh, you know, speak to a community like the LGBT community that often feels like they have not been heard in many ways. Well, I'll jump in just real quick to say that one of the things about storytelling 
collaboratively mm -hmm. in television is that things sort of happen when they happen. You can go in with a plan and an idea and then actors come along and bring that stuff to life and new directors and, um, and you know, other artists involved in the production come in and it becomes this big soup of all of these possibilities. Um, the thing that I think that's cool about working in television and Trek specifically right now is that there is absolute openness to a lot of stories and a lot of subjects that in the past, you know, we wouldn't have been telling or we would have been finding coded ways to discuss them. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. Yeah. Now yeah. there is a feeling that absolutely anything is possible. And specifically in the case of these two characters, you know, we didn't, they didn't, we didn't begin this story with the idea that that was going to happen. And then these two actors came together and they created what they did together. And suddenly it became very clear to us that that was absolutely something that we could do. And the choice to include it at the end of season one, the way it was, for me, it was an absolute clear indication that this is where we were going. You know, but one of the reasons that it took us so long to find our specific story for this audio drama was we needed to let the season mm -hmm. start up season two and find out where they wanted to be because that those were going to be our parameters and we couldn't drive that. The show has to drive that. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel it. I it's just it's always interesting for me to like ask those questions because I know it's it's got to be a difficult conversation, but that's the one thing I've appreciated about this era of Trek in all of its forms, whether it be, you know, audio dramas and the shows, is that it is an openness, like, you know, going and looking at Discovery being like, probably if the most diverse like Trek show ever in terms of any identity. Um, and Picard also continuing that in many ways too. Um, so it's just, it, it's, it's, it's always interesting to hear like the thought process of people going into that and like how you think about that. Um, I'm sorry, real quick. I think at this point it's a responsibility. Mm. Um, and you have to be careful. You don't want to tokenize it to be like, hey, look, we're shining a light on this in this very special moment. Like, it's mm -hmm. not that. It's writing the characters um, honestly. And and we have an issue of the Discovery comic book coming up that focuses on Adira mm -hmm. and um, their relationship with Tal and, and, and with uh, with Gray, I'm sorry, with, um, with Gray. And it was so nice to just sit in their story mm -hmm. right they weren't a supporting character they weren't this wasn't this was their story it's their book and i think um we need more we need more stories like that like just um and it's also about giving the opportunities for those authentic voices to be told by people who have lived that Almost. experience right yeah yeah like so um I think one of my favorite things about Star Trek is that it gives the real estate uh, for those stories to be told directly. And, and that, that goes back to even during the civil rights movement mm. when Star Trek was telling stories that I think anyone with a brain could tell what they were really talking about. Yeah. Um, That's what I've really loved about the evolution of Trek, right? Like there, there was an element of tokenization even going back in the original series, but as, as it's progressed further and further and further, especially to today, there's like, there, it, there feels like there's, from my end as a fan, um, you know, looking at you both who like get to create this stuff, an actual effort to like speak authentically to it and be inclusive rather than it being like, oh, look, we did our big gay episode, you know? Right. Um, so uh, we did our stigma, you know? <laughs> and so, um, and so, it's just it from from my end, I really appreciate that. And I like things like this, uh, this project, like legitimately when I listened to it, I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. This is wonderful. I was having an absolute blast, just like again, the 10 minutes of just them having a date was just right. Amazing. Like it's just the the normality of it. Mm -hmm. Again, not not sh you're shining a spotlight in the sense that they are the stars of the show. Mm -hmm. But but the but it's just the normality, like letting them live their lives authentically and yeah yeah i'm so I, glad you responded to that i think i think you both captured it like like big grand adventure stuff of it all like those small moments really really i think uh just absolutely sold it for me um but getting into the big grand adventure i do want to not be remiss and and not talk about some of the other stuff so uh some other stuff that i found interesting was um the villain so you have a kind of like the the romulan this romulan guy who's like trying to recreate the emperor uh, empire and sort of like has this sort of like like i'm sort of on my little hill trying to trying to recapture that what made you think of his character and sort of decide to have that guy be the villain and then sort of tying into the his larger pursuit of like this janice gate um idea KB? Um, well, 
I think to start with, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of cool political stuff happening in this space and time around Romulans and the, the former Romulan empire mm-hmm. because of the supernova. And thematically for Picard, it's a thing. So it, so digging deeper into some of the side effects of our choice not to help more Romulans back in the day um, feels very natural. But when we were first trying to create Reinen, we wanted to make sure and tried very hard to make him not just sort of like stock villain bad guy. Because, you know, in the early days of Trek, we made a Kringlon, we made a Romulan, we know it's a problem and it's going to end badly at some point. Um, and so we tried to dig into like, you know, who could this guy be? And we sort of latched on to the ideas that he was somebody who previously would not, who was basically an outcast in Romulan society that only something like the destruction of the empire would have given him a chance mm-hmm. to, um, to, to do what he's trying to do here. And then also just sort of like the notion that for someone who has, whose life has been a lot of impermanence, that the idea that you could have something forever would be the thing that would drive him. Like you, as a storyteller, you ask yourself, well, who wants to live forever? Like who's going to, who's going to chase something like that? Why is that even worth anything to them? And, and you sort of kind of work backwards and discuss the psychology of, well, there are people for whom that would be a really good idea. And a guy who wants to found an empire that's going to last forever is one of them. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of mirrors what happened to the, the Romulan empire just in general. Like there has to be like a general feeling by many Romulans of like the, the sense of loss of loss of identity and like loss of like this, something that was like people always thought the Roman empire would last. And very clearly the Romulans are meant to evoke the Roman empire in many ways. Um, and it collapses around them and sort of like the, the um, disillusionment that comes with that, I think is it's kind of mirrored with that. And so the wanting to like, oh, we can keep keep it going. It's still going to last, I think is, is mirrored in that concept. I thought was very cool. Yeah, we, we I, I kind of think of them like Lego blocks. Uh, as we're building the story, you're sort of looking around for what are the things that we can take? Seeds, we'll just mix all the analogies, seeds, Lego blocks. <laughs> but it's like, okay, we have the destruction of Romulus in this really weird geopolitical, astropolitical, situation and then we have Fenris Ranger space we have the Fenris Rangers we have our leads and their particular you know as Kirsten pointed out their yen for adventure and just sort of plugging those in and starting to build and then the story kind of comes out and I think the professor and his relationship with his wife is sort of the the special one that that sort of made everything come together mm-hmm. um he's sort of like the lemnus gate which is our live the lemnus gate guy. apologies i said yeah. oh no gate. <laughs> it's such a simple word how could you know yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. crazy he rolls right off the where did, actually i kirsten i think you came up with that where did where did that come from i might have googled figure eight shape something and <laughs> oh yeah that's a lemnus gate and i was like oh, 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 oh. Right it well, makes me feel it. better that google google and thesaurus <laughs> looking up are, are also used by by people in your situation <laughs> oh, yeah. there is so much yeah. stuff i don't know yeah <laughs> we never look at memory alpha <laughs> oh ever. yeah i'm sure never never <laughs> not yeah. yeah um but yeah so it was it was sort of gathering all these pieces and for ryan in, in particular it was it was yeah it was just like kirsten was saying um and this idea also of, of like Romulans are so much in service to the state. Mm-hmm. So what is the opposite of that? It's a guy who values his individuality so much, he's going to end up creating his own state. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's, it's, it's transposing like, oh, well, I can become the state, right? It's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's that sort of idea that people, that often people do is like, well, if I want to, they, when you associate the state with, with power, you seek to become the state. We see that yeah. even today with people seeking power. Yeah. Just program. look at, just look at the headlines today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, which questioning me is questioning the government. That sort of idea I think is, is, yep. is very much here. Um, speaking, I mean, going into a slightly different direction too, that I also found really beautiful was, was the professor. Um, I found him to be uh, like really sleep, like clearly having some form of dementia um, was heartbreaking to, to just like listen to, but then his, I think what again, gut punched me. And I think you referenced it earlier was the letters that seven, read and that she related to in a way that I don't think like she's ever been able to in any way shape or form and so like again I, 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 I'm I curious like where that came from and what you wanted to uh, like where where would it which way did it come from and just like wanting to have a character that fit into this plot or did it like come from a place of 
fulfilling Seven's character and coming out of that? I think it came first out of theme, right? We knew we were going to be delving into different kinds of love and different aspects of love. And then we start talking about, well, what kind of relationship would you hold up, you know, and what would be the characteristics of that? And I think the relationship between these two people uh, was the first thing that sort of came out even more than the individual people involved, right? And then it just became a matter of what is a, what is a circumstance under which Seven might have run across somebody like this, you know? and and how could she end up in possession of these documents that would, you know, have allowed her to get such a, such a glimpse into this relationship that, you know, in most cases you would never know. I mean, that's just two people's private lives, you know, and it became sort of like her touchstone for, gosh, this would be cool to have, you know, I think before she read those letters, she didn't know that sort of thing existed. And I'm not sure where she would have seen it in the life that she leads, you know? Oh, come on with Janeway. Come on. That, my, sorry. That's the that's shipper me coming out. <laughs> that's a big starship. That's a ship that as far as shipping goes. That's so, a, that, that ship has sailed, I feel like at this point, but <laughs> uh, season three and four and five. Find out. One day, one day we'll get her in product. Maybe prodigy. Who yeah, knows? yeah. Yeah. Uh, get Jerry over in that. But yeah, no, I think, I think that that is, it is really nice to see. And, and again, it is, it's what I really love a card for as a show because it does sort of like allow us to have this big jump with these characters um, and, and sort of see them in new places. You know, I feel like, I mean, this is the thing that um, I think with franchises that go on this long uh, are starting to interrogate of like, what if our heroes don't necessarily follow the, like, I'm going to be the hero all the time progression. I mean, you know, as controversial it was, we saw that with Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, which is as much as I have feelings about that movie, that was part of it I actually really loved, him not having just gone on to be the awesome hero Jedi. Mm -hmm. um, and so here with Picard, you know, not just, uh, you know, Picard himself, who clearly has that trajectory, but Seven as well, like, she is not where we would have expected her to be. Like, my th always thought was like, she'd be working at, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the Daystrom Institute or something at some point in the series. That seemed like the trajectory. So to have her be this on the edge Fenris Ranger character was really cool. Um, and I think jump going into that to get to an actual question uh, was I really loved how you built out the Fenris Ranger characters in this story. So I'm curious how you uh, how you came to the concepts. Uh, my personal favorite, I'm blanking on his name at the top of my head, but the, the guy who just he does not use the universal translator was so endearing. Like every time he screws up, like that was just so sweet. And I, I was like, I was like, I just want to pinch your cheeks with how adorable you are. <laughs> so I'm curious where 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 those characters came from. Some of the early stuff on that had to do with just what sort of qualities could we imbue these characters with that uh, would make them very clear to a listener mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who's who's watching them. And so the idea with, of just playing with language and the sounds of, of languages was, um, was some of the early, you know, development of that mm -hmm. and those guys. And I think there was like, when you hear Fenris Rangers, it's such a cool name. You think of like, rescue rangers are like here we are to save the day we're the mm -hmm. fenris rangers <laughs> and it was fun to take the completely opposite and they're like these kind of weird little individuals who each have their own thing going on and like that that was a way into oh that's fun characterization we can write that like we can we can do that as opposed to sort of a, a bland generic um yeah police, police, police force. force yeah Space like police. yeah it, it, it made them it really gave across just to the personalities of like a hobbled together force of like random people that just like we just came together because no one else would do do the work and so yeah. it's just like random people um and and i'm curious too like how did um you know one of the things that i think that makes that work really well in this story is because of an audio drama like obviously you could have people mispronounce words and it'd be a fun joke within a show but I think specifically since it is an audio medium and it's so dialogue heavy that that those jokes land even harder uh, and really endear you to the character more. So I'm also curious, like what if like that and if there was any other choice that you specifically thought like the medium of audio will heighten or enhance or make us have to do it this way? Well, I think the character of Dee as well um, and the choice to have his language, um, I, I had long ago written a scene in Tamarian where like the words that they're going to be saying are not going to convey meaning to the reader, right? Mm -hmm. They're basically mm -hmm. going to be nonsense sounds, but to the other character in the scene, 
they absolutely understand them and how you convey how you actually convey what's going on when that skill is taken away from you is very interesting. And it felt like in the audio format, that would again be an exciting thing to play with. Can we have somebody speaking alien gibberish that we do not understand and still make clear what is actually happening? We, we kind of set challenges like that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we're able to make the whole thing feel more vivid and more real. Right. Because there is a lot of like you were saying, Mike, just a lot of like stock characters. This is the pilot of the ship. This is the, you know, um, the captain and off we're going to go. And everywhere we could, we fought against what would be typical or standard in those characters to try to find what was unique and special about them and also how they related to Seven and Rocky. Yeah. And you'll see in that we're, you know, we're uh, planning and uh, to release the script for. Oh. deaf and hard of hearing fans so oh, awesome. they can they can um hear the story and uh they um you'll see in the script that we it, when deet talks we had to make sure what deet was saying underneath um or i think we just put it in ended up just putting it in parentheses or brackets right with the understanding that that would be sound effects and or or his funny voice and so you'll see that you can actually read it so that it's a conversation you can understand on the page because we had to know the actors had to know exactly mm -hmm. what was what was being said. Yeah. But that's a great question. And, and I think we definitely did a, a few passes where we would just go through and say, okay, is this making sense if we can't see anything? Like if, if we just are listening or is it tracking with no visual cues whatsoever? That was really fun. It was a really fun challenge, but, um, yeah, definitely rule number one of, of writing audio, I think. Yeah, as someone, um, personally, as someone who wants to get into writing audio, because again, a huge audio drama mm -hmm. fan, I, I'm curious, like, how much you, um, I'm actually be very excited to read that script, uh, how much you put in, like, sound effects, and how much you're thinking about those specific things as you write. Um, like, how, how do you envision it? Um, is it sort of like, you think of the sound effects that could work? Or do you think of like envision the scene and then the sound effects come after? Because like one thing that stuck out for me, for example, was uh, when in the beginning of the audio drama where they're still in Raffi's trailer, you have like them having an argument and you hear Raffi putting away the dishes. And so you, I just really, I could see Michelle Heard like, like just not even looking at Seven and like, you could see the blocking in your head without actually um, without actually having the visuals. Something I'm curious, like how you think about that as you're writing. Do you think of the blocking? Do you think of just the sound or how does that go? Well, this weird thing happened where we had written the outline, which didn't have a lot of those kind of details in it. And then the conversation came up about what sound effects from the shows we could have access to. Mm -hmm. So we both sort of went back and did some rewatching to sort of pull some of the sounds and it all became very fresh in our head. So that when it came to actually writing the script, we already had an idea, like a list of like, these are the things that we could use. And I built sort of like set design or set kind of cues into the script, just as I would, this is what we're seeing in a television script. This is what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. I wanna hear the wind chimes. I wanna hear the insects. I wanna hear the this, that, you know. Um, and all of those were very much in the script and very much, but then of course, beautifully designed and rendered by the team at Simon & Schuster. Yeah, they did hey, a great Jesse, job. Jesse, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Yeah, you should be able Is to share screen. KB, are you cool if I just show a page from like the opening page of, this, of one of the drafts? Hell, that would be cool awesome. Little multimedia experience here? I'm here for that. Okay, let me, let me pull it up. Um, hang on. Discuss amongst yourselves while I... Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Let me just make sure the recording doesn't break. Oh, it says I you've disabled. Oh, sorry, I can I can yeah. fix that. Let's see. You can share all participants. You should be able to do it now. Okay, here is a look at. Look at that! Haha! -ha. Got to give. Oh, that's so cool. Got to give Gene the shout out. <laughs> So here's, Ooh, um, no. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Writer's Draft Revised, October 12th, 2021. So uh, before we were recording, I think, yes. Okay. Um, so here you can see, and Kirsten wrote this scene. Mm -hmm. 
so she can i'll let why don't you talk about it otherwise i'll just pass it off just pass pass and pass it off well it was like it was a super fun day and i don't remember when it was although it was early in the process ruby honey sorry about my dog um you're fine you're fine where we remembered that we had a record player to play with so suddenly i was going to ask about the music that these guys would be listening to could be anything and just you know digging into what rios's record collection might have sounded like was just an, an incredibly fun thought exercise but one of the cool things it did for us was it gave us the opportunity to imagine new kinds of sounds in trek music mm. um, and to play with them here because you know we don't have any control over that kind of stuff you know anywhere else on the tv scene. so um so this was like um I just remember like, what is it? We're in the desert. What does that feel like? What does that sound like? What does that smell like? Even though that doesn't, you know, necessarily come into play. Mm -hmm. And then, and then what is, what kind of sound is going to get us into the, the you mood know, the mood and the feeling of it. And it, you know, it just so happens that um, this, these two composers, three composers, JP, Lisa and David um, have been working together for years. Um, and JP and Lisa specifically have a, um, have a band that they have played with for a long time called Incendio. Um, and the, it is some of the most beautiful Spanish guitar you've ever heard in your life. I was um, actually, that was, that was actually going to be my next question was like, yeah. how did you choose the music? Because it was not only the two things I loved about it, not only was it beautiful, like listening to the opening sequence, like it's this gorgeous music, but also mm -hmm. the choice to like make it diegetic to like make it part of the scene as opposed to like, you know, the, um, you know, just like background music that you typically get and things like this. Um, yeah. and it not, and also the choice to have it not be the big brassy Star Trek thing that we normally get, or even, even the more subdued melancholic stuff of, of Picard's theme. So. Yeah. We knew we were going to have space for all of that, but, um, but like the, the record player was one thing and then Deet always listening to different kind of music was another mm -hmm. You know, I think we had at least eight or nine different cues of just totally different swings and styles of music um, that he might be listening to on any given day. And all of it felt possible um, just because why, why not? Like, you know, he's a guy on his own ship. He's going to listen to music if he wants to, like, it just, yeah. you know. Um, and then, of course, we also had tr more traditional kind of score, our adventure theme, our sort of Seven and Raffi theme. And, um, and all of those came out of very long and detailed conversations with the composers and then um you know them going back and forth with um lots of different instruments and which ones best captured you know the sound that we were looking for and then being able to say to them like uh we need a romulan anthem it's going to be sung <laughs> a cappella for like i don't know 11 seconds like in, in, and now i have like around the romulan war song um or the beautiful um uh, we'll be together again song that the professor hums and then you know we hear sort of like the full recording of um that was uh it started as an idea of of some songs of that era and it we was uh we'll meet again we were going to use right. we'll, we'll meet again and um right. but i actually like what we ended up with better it's, it's well it got to be, i mean by making it ourselves we got to do something a little bit more specific too yeah which is i was I like I, I do like a good like music choice like um uh why am I blanking on it um blue skies in in Picard I mean very yes. clearly evoking stuff but I also really I I do really think the music was absolutely beautiful which you should, oh, cool. if, if you haven't you should release it separately because it's wonderful oh uh, that would actually be a really fun yeah. thing um but yeah no I I I really appreciate that I thought that was very very cool um so I know I'm keeping an eye on the time because I know we don't have have a ton more but I do want to ask um. This, I'm going to ask two different questions, one for you, Kirsten, one to Mike, because they're kind of two sides of the different coin. I know there's only so much you can say, um, given that's not out. But for Kirsten, um, what what was it like sort of like trying this into season two like, as someone who works on the show, knowing where this is all going? And like, I know you sort of said this was written after the fact, um, for the most part, but like knowing that you can like sort of play with some of the like maybe hints or things like that going into season two. 
Um, and then, you know, after that, Mike, I would love to hear your thoughts as someone who doesn't work on the show um, and, and sort of what your experience was and, and not just in this, but in other stuff with like disco and, and all your other work being like, well, I'm just here to play in other people's playgrounds for a while and, and sort of figuring out what that sort of feel is. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I think oftentimes I think of doing media tie-ins in general as doing puzzles. Mm -hmm. which I absolutely love to do. Um, and this one was a very, had to be very finely drawn because the, the, the specifics of things that were gonna happen in season two, where characters were gonna start out um, and anything about their journey, that was all totally gonna be off limits. Um, but the emotional story we were telling and tracking that through the adventure that we set it against had to be really, really finely modulated, right? These were not, big moves for the characters. They were very, very small moves, but they had to have Ruby honey. <laughs> but you know, they had to, they had to, um, they had to build and they had to grow and then they had to resolve. And um, I, I've never done anything specifically like that. Um, and it was incredibly, it was really hard, but really, really rewarding when we finally found it, you know? Um, and knowing then that people who had seen season one and then we're going to watch season two, we're going to, if they, if they did pick this up, they would definitely feel like they had been, you know, teed up for where they were going to be. It's going to be less of a, you know, not that it's not going to be a surprise, but just like, oh, now I know emotionally. Where this, where this is going to go. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I kind of want to, I want to get to your question too, but I, no, I, no, no. I'm curious, like, well, uh, is this the first time that you you've done one of these where it like came as an interstitial because I, I know most of your Voyager novels um were set after you know you could kind of had free reign um but i don't remember if you've done any other tie-ins that that were this like very specifically centered i'm not entirely sure off the top of my head um well so the only one that i did on my own was the uh the very first thing i ever wrote which was the um well the short story is about short and then the the fusion uh novel which was right the right 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 second book in the string theory trilogy so that yes, was yes. the beginning of it but since then even though i don't write them i've coordinate all of the authors who do all the novels for all of our new series. So all the discovery novels, all the, so I am constantly looking for the very small stories that the can gaps. be woven, the very, very small gaps that we have in storytelling um, in each of those series. That like, feels like my job nowadays. Um, it's, gotta, and, it's, uh, it's, it's gotta be hard considering how everything's so tightly woven in all the shows now, as opposed to before where you could be like, eh, it happened on a week that we didn't see on Voyager, you know? A hundred percent. It's incredibly hard. Mm-hmm. You know, expect. but we've done what we can. Well, you're doing good. I, like I said, I've been, I've been a fan of, of, of all the books. Like they've been, they've been absolutely wonderful as, as a big novel fan. I'm, I'm the nerd that likes the novels better than the shows. No offense to your work on the shows, but I love the novels and comics. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but Mike, yeah, passing it back over to you. Like what's, what's it like for this specifically, uh, working in this one I mean obviously you've been doing it for a while with like the mm -hmm. Kelvin timeline comics probably had a lot of like eyes looking at what you were doing I'm sure mm -hmm. um but for this one like you're writing it to directly tie into something that's directly coming out very soon so yeah it was um it was great because it felt you know sometimes when you're working on ancillary stuff you know you have a dedicated fan base that really appreciates the work and, and really enjoys it but it can be limited by the just fact of life, lower marketing budgets of, mm -hmm. of those projects. Whereas this, we knew we had the weight of Simon and Schuster um, and by extension, the network behind us. Um, so that was exciting to know, we're just gonna get a bigger audience than we do on the comics. Mm -hmm. um, and I work on the, the games too, but that's different because the games are less sort of creator, fo you know, it's, it's more about the overall project. Um, this is, you know, our names are on it. And um, so that was exciting. Um, the challenge, exactly as Kirsten said, it's like, you know, you're just weaving between the two seasons that are, and it's a train that's laying the track in front of it. Even from the first day of, of pre-production on Discovery season one is when the train takes off. The train doesn't stop between the seasons. Yeah, and the train that. is always going. So we're, we're running alongside um, helping to make sure, although Kirsten's sort of on the train and I'm running <laughs> this analogy. It's like they're laying the track and you're going through you and trying to like make sure the nails are still down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 
that is always that's just a moving target and for all ancillaries but for this one in particular because we had to come out at a certain time we had to get the actors to be available to do it at a certain time and it's all worked out and i just no i didn't jinx it because it's already out okay so it, it, it worked out in perfect timing so yeah and i want to give a shout out actually before we go to christina zerfanitas who was our amazing director who brought everything together um and uh yeah kept kept us writing and and directed all the voice recordings and was really um the power behind the scenes of this whole project awesome yeah. well i uh, looking at the clock i do want to wrap out so uh i will say two things one before uh before i sort of offer it up to pitch and for you to hawk your wares um as as you wish uh i do wish to say and i know i said this earlier and i know I said this before we started recording but Truly, like both of your work, as someone who's been following both of your work since I was very young, <laughs> again, not to make you feel, feel old, but like I've been a big fan of both of your works for very a long time. Um, in many cases, since I grew up in the gap where it was like enterprise, then nothing for such a long time, <laughs> yeah. both of you created the Star Trek that I got to look forward to and grew wow. up with. Um, so, you know, you don't really think about the tie in fiction stuff all that much. Um, uh, in terms of like the big excitement for the shows. But for me, that in many ways was my trek. So I just wish to say thank you for this and thank you for, for all the work that you've done with, with the tie and stuff. It really, as someone who's a big Trekkie, it really does mean a lot. So thank you. And it, it has been an honor to speak with both of you. So I just want you to both know that. Thank you so much. You made my day. <laughs> yeah. I wish my last my year. Oh, I'm so a, great to hear. Yeah, I'm glad because like really I said, I'm meaningful I, to, to us. And I would go into like every time I would go and buy one of your comics, Mike, or I was like devouring, or I would like look forward to another voyage of novel. I read every single one, um, like reading those. Uh, and I'm like, Oh, thank God she brought Jane well, my back. <laughs> you, you are, you are just, you're who I was writing for. Yeah. I was writing for you. We didn't know each other yet, oh, but you were my audience when I sat down to write and to, to make you happy as a fan. So as a reader, thank you. You very much did. You very, very much did. I and also, I was just going to say, those readers were the ones who taught me mm. what I needed to know to create Star Trek. Like, I came into it as a fan myself, but as I wrote those stories and then I talked with all the people who were reading them, this is a very tight, very intense group of people who have a deep, deep passion for this stuff and who want it to be great. And I, I really credit them for bringing that out in me. Mm. No, I am, I am, I am. Thank you for for saying that. As it just ubiquitously, I I I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I will I will let you to wrap out. Uh, just Kirsten, we know what you're working on, but you might as well say it. Uh, what, what's what's coming up for both of you? What do you wanna What do you wanna share? Well, um, everybody, buckle up and get ready for season one of Strange New Worlds, which will be out, I think, in May. Mm -hmm. Um. And then uh, we've got another season of Discovery coming after that and season three, two and three of Picard coming up. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't There's even- two, Yeah, it's like, we, we you know, I just figured I'd at least be, be kind of Yeah, say. yeah. <laughs> Where am I today? What day of the week is it? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. for all of it. It looks very, very exciting. Um, Mike, I know you mentioned the Adira comic, who, by the way, my friend Aaron Harvey, I think is doing a cover for, for that. Um, the great Aaron Harvey is mm -hmm. doing incredible covers for these- I've, I've seen the Adira like, one and it's it's beautiful. Oh, you have okay, yeah, yeah. It's it's bonkers. Ask him to show you the Detmer one he just did. Oh, this okay, week, I will. Which is I will. amazing. So that series is called it's Star Trek Discovery Adventures in the Thirty Second Century, mm -hmm. and it's four issues. Each issue spots spotlights a different character. The first one is Grudge. It's told from Grudge's point of view. And shout out to Rob Perlman's book, The Book of Grudge. If if you need more grudge, definitely. Get that. <laughs> we all need more yeah. grudge. Absolutely, the queen. Uh, and then the second issue is Adira, and that one tells the story. So the the grudge one's kind of lighthearted. The Adira one is is more personal and um, emotional, showing uh, Adira and Gray early in their relationship, and then what happened to separate them, and how Adira ended up in the Earth Defense Force to where they are in at the start of uh, season four, I guess it would kind of be season four. I'm excited um, as, as a trans and non-binary fan, that's the one I'm very excited for. So. Sweet, well, I, 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 hope, I hope you like it and I would be happy to come and 
I will. If if you're down for that, I will. Yeah. Be absolutely thrilled to have you. Um, back. That'd be great. And uh, issue three focuses on Detmer. And all I can say about it is, if you love Calvin and Hobbes, you'll remember Spaceman Spiff. <laughs> And it's basically an homage to Spaceman Spiff. Oh, that's okay. Sorry, Detmer. I I love Galpin Hops growing up, so I'm excited uh, for that too. You're selling you're selling uh, me on all I'm this. I'm selling you copies. Yeah. And then the last one is uh, a Linus story. It's told from Linus's point of view and uh, how he sees the crew and and how he's adjusting to um, being, I think, the only Saurian on board. Yeah. Oh, Linus for Linus. He always just, he's always sick or dealing with some some poor guy. When you have to live in a human atmosphere, a human centric atmosphere all day. Yeah. I feel bad. I feel bad for him. Well, thank you again, both of you. It was really great. And um, yeah, thank you for doing this. And I look forward to, to all your work and thank you again. So much fun. Thanks. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure.